Stuff Podcasts. Hi, I'm Michael Wright, and welcome to the long read from Stuff. This week's episode is called The Secret History of New Zealand's Indiana Jones. It's by press reporter Lee Kenny, who joins me now. Hi, Lee. Hi, Mike. Third time back in the booth. Welcome. Thank you very much. Nice to be back. Thank you for having me. So it's a few days ahead of Anzac Day that we're recording this, and this story is Anzac-themed or or military-themed. It's a toughie for me, Anzac Day, because it comes around every year, and we do stories every year, of course, and coverage is tricky. It's not like it's bad or not worthy, but you sometimes feel like you've, you've read the stories before. And I can confidently say I have never read a story like this one before. Tell us what it's about. Yeah, it's, it is quite a unique one, actually. It's something that was kind of brought to our attention by uh, New Zealand Remembrance Army, uh, who obviously ensure that um, veterans and New Zealand's war stories are not forgotten. And they kind of brought to our attention uh, this Christchurch man. Uh, his name was Edgar Sanders, uh, known as Sandy. And uh, he served in the Second World War and had a quite incredible uh, military history, and in spite of the the, the many kind of um, uh, kind of exploits that he got up to, both during the war and after the war, his kind of story was not particularly well known. So I was just kind of interested in in kind of uh, going back through the archives, speaking to his family, and just kind of hoping to do justice to this incredible story that he had. Yeah, and as we'll hear, uh, no spoilers here, but he had two acts, Sandy. He had his wartime service, and then he had this kind of remarkable post-war adventures as well, and. There is a news hook because, as you say, the New Zealand Remembrance Army kind of brought this story to our attention and there is, yeah, new stuff happening. So um, tell us a bit about that and and why the story is being retold by you now. So it's no exaggeration to describe uh, Sanders uh, as an Indiana Jones type figure. Uh, So during the Second World War, uh, he uh, very quickly joined uh, New Zealand uh, Expeditionary Force and was assigned to the uh, anti-tank unit. Uh, From that, he joined the then sort of experimental long-range patrol, which sent these kind of small units uh, deep into the deserts in North Africa behind enemy lines, causing all sorts of havoc. And... uh, Pretty much we had had these incredible kind of brushes with death uh, throughout the Second World War. Then when the war ended, uh, that was when he kind of set sail, uh, kind of headed out into the Pacific and um, without kind of giving away uh, too many spoilers, went to try and find some lost Incan treasure. His Indiana Jones phase, by the sounds. Yeah, that's that's right. It's 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 a it's a story that, that genuinely could have been the plot of um, an Indiana Jones movie. All right, let's get into it. Here is Lee reading his story. The Secret History of New Zealand's Indiana Jones. Officially, they were called Number One Demolition Squadron, but everyone knew them as Popsky's private army. Formed in October 1942, the elite unit carried out daring World War II missions in the Libyan desert and the Italian mountains. They attacked enemy convoys, destroyed airports and freed Allied prisoners. Among their number was Sergeant Edgar Sandy Sanders, a Kiwi known for his coolness and courage under fire. His wartime heroics are well documented in military circles, but almost unknown in New Zealand. Born in 1915, Sanders grew up in Christchurch, one of seven children. After leaving school, he worked on a farm, but his father, a wharfie at Littleton Port, got him a job as a deck boy, cleaning and servicing ships anchored in the harbour. By his early twenties he was at sea, crewing steamboats in the Atlantic and Caribbean. He was living in London in September 1939, when the Second World War broke out. Within weeks he had signed up to fight. He enlisted in the New Zealand Expeditionary Force, and was assigned to the anti-tank unit in Egypt. The following year, he was one of a number of Kiwis to volunteer to join a clandestine, newly formed unit, the Long Range Patrol. It was a hush-hush outfit, says Sanders' son Peter. They wanted people who could navigate, who were hardy, outdoor people. The Long Range Patrol was the first Allied unit to operate behind German and Italian lines in North Africa. 
driving specially adapted jeeps, stripped of the doors and windscreens, and carrying limited supplies, its members ventured hundreds of kilometers into enemy territory, carrying out hit and run raids and gathering intelligence, often deep in the Sahara Desert. As the Africa campaigns intensified, the long range patrol was expanded and the Long Range Desert Group, or LRDG, was formed in July 1940. The new unit was based in Cairo, under the command of Major Ralph Bagnold, a World War I veteran and geologist who worked in the Libyan desert in the 1930s. Bagnold wanted tough, self-reliant men who could operate in the harsh conditions, or, as it was put, only men who did not mind a hard life, with scanty food, little water, and lots of discomfort. Sanders and plenty of other Kiwis got the nod. In fact, with the exception of a few officers, the LRDG was made up entirely of New Zealand soldiers when it was formed. The Kiwi group's vehicles were named for places back home, Topo, Tianao, and so on. As well as dealing with the harsh conditions, the volunteers were bound by a strict performance measure. They were only allowed to make one mistake. A second, and they would be returned to their regiment. Known as the Scorpions, due to their distinctive cap badge, the unit operated in Tunisia, Libya and Egypt, and became one of Britain's most famous special forces, foreshadowing the Special Air Service, or SAS, founded a year later. The LRDG were expert navigators, often using a sun compass invented by Bagnold to navigate the desert. The device consisted of a horizontal disc and a knitting needle, which could be manually adjusted to track the direction of the sun. The LRDG troops were so good at traversing the featureless landscape, they often transported the SAS, earning the nickname the Libyan Taxi Service. Their Italian enemies had a different name for them, Patulia Fantasma, the Ghost Patrol. So named for the fact they often had no idea the LRDG had been somewhere until after they'd gone. But not every raid went undetected, and as a gunner, Sanders would have to be ready for action. During one skirmish in southwest Libya in 1941, he was part of a successful attack on an aerodrome the unit dodging machine gun fire as they fled. On another mission, his truck was blown to pieces by the Luftwaffe. Sanders and others had to walk 320 kilometres across the desert to get back to base. The unit's reputation travelled even further. They were the scourge of Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, commander of Germany's Africa Corps. The Nazi strategist noted in his diary that the LRDG had caused us more damage than any other British unit of equal strength. In a dispatch sent in 1941, Allied General Archibald Wavell praised their inconspicuous but invaluable service. Not only have patrols brought back much information, but they have attacked enemy forts, captured personnel and grounded aircraft as far as 800 miles inside hostile territory. All up, 239 New Zealanders served in the Long Range Desert Group. But Sanders was the only Kiwi drafted into an even more specialist unit. One tasked with causing havoc behind enemy lines. It was known as Popsky's Private Army. Led by Major Vladimir Pinyakov. A brilliant, well-connected Belgian engineer and polymyth who lived in Egypt before the war. Peniakoff, known as Popsky by his English-speaking comrades who struggled to pronounce his name, formed the team in October 1942. With just 23 members, it was the smallest independent unit in the British Army. The culture was also different. Uniforms were optional, and officers were rarely addressed as sir. Sanders joined Popsky's private army in May 1943. He carried out clandestine reconnaissance in the desert before the unit transferred to Italy. 
During one raid, they snuck into an Italian castle, captured the radio and three operators. They were spotted as they left, and all hell broke loose. The Nazis attempted to shoot their own wireless operators to stop their codes getting into the hands of the Allies. In early 1945, Sanders injured his leg and was sent back to New Zealand. Popsky's private army was disbanded that September, soon after the war ended, but Sanders and his unit leader corresponded for years afterwards. A paperback book of Penyakov's exploits was published in 1950. It became a bestseller. Hi, I'm Michael Wright, host of The Long Read. If you're an advertiser and you like what you're hearing, you could help us keep making podcasts like this one. Thousands of people listen to stuff podcasts every day. So if you'd like to be part of one of New Zealand's biggest and best podcast platforms, go to advertise.stuff.co.nz slash audio and get in touch with us. Back to the show. By the late 1940s, Edgar Sanders was back at sea, this time sailing the Pacific for the fabled Treasure of Lima. A vast hoard of gold and precious stones plundered by the Spanish from the Incas in the 16th century. Today, it would be worth billions of dollars. The booty was stolen by buccaneers in the 1820s and hidden on a deserted island. Sanders believed he knew exactly where. He was part of a group who sailed to Central America with Paddy, an obscure Irishman who said he was a descendant of the pirates who buried the treasure and, crucially, had a map. Official logs show that Paddy was part of the crew when the ship entered Panama, but not when it left. Sanders and the remaining crew, married couple, Alice and Norman Edwards followed the map to Cocos Island, 550 kilometres off the coast of Costa Rica. One night, a huge storm dashed their boat against the reef and the three were shipwrecked. They salvaged what they could and survived by fishing and hunting wild pigs. Finally, a passing boat spotted their fire and offered them an escape. The Edwards jumped at the chance, but Sanders decided to stay, intent on finding the hidden jewels. The boat's captain promised to return in a few months to pick him up. Armed with a pistol, a shotgun and a single book that he read over and over again, Sanders lived alone for months. Using a dugout canoe, he scoured the island. He found a few gold coins, but no hidden treasure. When the boat captain finally returned, Sanders decided he'd given it his best shot. After 18 months on the island, it was time to leave, but his adventures weren't over. The boat was heading south to Santa Cruz in the Galapagos Islands. Today, Santa Cruz is the hub for the Galapagos, but in the early 1950s, only a handful of people lived there. It's not clear why Sanders decided to stay, but he quickly fitted in with a small community, mostly made up of European families. He bought a yacht and earned a living taking researchers around the neighbouring islands. He lived in a house on the beach and hosted parties fuelled by a homemade liquor he distilled. It was during one of these get-togethers that he met a young Ecuadorian woman named Mariana Lopez. By the late 1950s, the Ecuadorian government became concerned that Peru might make a claim for the Galapagos. It relocated 27 families from the mainland to shore up its foothold on the islands. Among them was Mariana, who was in her early 20s. Sanders threw one of his parties just to get to know her. They got married on the island and had four children three daughters and a son, Peter. The family left Santa Cruz in the mid-1960s. Before they set sail, 
Sanders gave his treasure map to an Ecuadorian friend. I think this guy might have found some, Peter Sanders says, because he became very rich. The family arrived in Christchurch and settled in Aranui. Sanders worked as a linesman for the Municipal Electrical Department until he retired. He died in 1987. A modest plaque at the Canterbury Memorial Gardens and Crematorium recorded his passing. In loving memory of Edgar C. Sanders, it read, with no hint of his remarkable life. Former Army Major Simon Strombon, founder and chief executive of the New Zealand Remembrance Army, knew of Sanders' story. He met Sanders' widow, Mariana, at an Anzac Day parade. Strombon, who served in Afghanistan, thought Sanders' story needed to be remembered. He was a real-life Indiana Jones, he says. In April 2022, just before Anzac Day, Sanders' family gathered at his grave to unveil a new, more fitting memorial. It was organised by the Remembrance Army and details the extraordinary war history of Edgar Sandy Sanders. It mentions the New Zealand Expeditionary Force, the Long Range Desert Group and Popsky's private army and includes the cap badges of those two legendary units. There's no one else with that service, Strombon says. It's important that we protect this military history. If we don't celebrate these guys, they're just going to disappear. That was The Secret History of New Zealand's Indiana Jones on The Long Read from Stuff, written and read by Lee Kenny and produced by me, Michael Wright. This episode was edited by Sam Scannell. Stuff's podcast director is Adam Dudding. If you listen via our website, you can hear this story and more like it on The Long Read podcast, available on all the usual platforms. If you liked what you heard, please give us a five-star rating and a review. It helps other listeners find us. Thanks for listening. 